Hello, welcome to this presentation. This is going to be a lecture on the placebo effect. We'll be covering the following topics in this lecture. Some background information, definitions, possible mechanisms underlying the placebo effect, placebo effect in depression, placebo effect in a couple of uh, men medical disorders, nocebo effect, using placebos in clinical trials, and we'll end the presentation with uh, five self-assessment MCQs. Uh, some information about myself. I am a consultant psychiatrist based in Chennai in India. I have worked for several years in the United Kingdom. So the placebo effect is a fascinating phenomenon in clinical practice. Several studies have shown that there is a significant placebo effect in many medical disorders including psychiatric disorders. And the term placebo is derived from a Latin word. Some experts make a distinction between the placebo effect and placebo response. And according to them, placebo effect is just one of the many components of an overall placebo response. However, for the purpose of this lecture, I'll be using these terms synonymously. Henry Beecher, who was an American anesthesiologist, coined the phrase placebo effect in 1955. He reported that about a third of patients who had a range of medical disorders, they showed improvement when they were given placebo. This subsequently led to the introduction of uh, randomized placebo controlled trials whereby a new drug is said to have significant benefit only if it shows superiority over placebo. So in a randomized placebo controlled trial, an active drug is compared with a placebo and only if the active drug has greater benefit than the placebo, is it considered to have specific effect for that particular condition. The placebo effect has been a source of interesting debate in psychiatry. Some skeptics claim that most, if not all, of the benefit from antidepressants is due to the placebo effect. However, there are others who have contended with evidence that response to placebo and response to antidepressants involve distinct biological mechanisms. We we'll look at some definitions. Typically, a placebo is an inert substance with no inherent pharmacological activity. So when it is compared with an active drug in a clinical trial, the appearance of the placebo will be exactly identical to that of the active drug. 
an active placebo is one that has its own inherent effects but none for the condition for which it is being given for. An example would be the use of uh, atropin as the control drug in trials of tricyclic antidepressants. However, for all practical purposes, when we talk about placebo, we are talking about the inert placebo, not the active placebo. Placebos can also be non-pharmacological, so-called procedural placebos. This would include sham ECT, where the patient is anesthetized but is not given ECT. So a sham ECT would be the placebo arm in a trial in which real ECT is given to one group of patients and sham ECT is given to the other group. And surgical placebo similarly is where the patient is anesthetized and superficial procedures are done but the actual surgery is not performed. And placebo equivalents are also being employed in complementary medicine. An example would be sham acupuncture where needles are placed at non-acupuncture points. Now let us look at possible mechanisms underlying the placebo effect. Natural remission theory, classical or Pavlovian conditioning, patient expectations, other psychological factors and neurobiological factors. So what is the natural remission theory? So this states that the improvement that occurs when you administer a placebo is coincidental and would have occurred even without it. So the natural remission theory can explain the placebo effect in short-lived conditions like common cold or headache, but it does not satisfactorily explain why patients who have had chronic conditions like hypertension or schizophrenia also show improvement with placebo. Regression to the mean. This is a statistical concept. Let us assume that an initial test result, for example, a BP reading is clearly abnormal. In other words, it is quite far away from the mean. If the same test is repeated, statistically, there is a greater likelihood for the second test result to be closer to the mean than for it to be more extreme than the first result. So in other words, the second test result would represent an improvement over the first one. Let us look at an example. In order to be eligible to enter a clinical trial in depression, only patients who are significantly unwell, that is patients who, whose depression score is above a certain cutoff point, are eligible. So their initial score when they are assessed for trial eligibility would have to be clearly abnormal. At follow-up, they are more likely to show an improvement, in other words, the depression score being closer to the mean, than being more extreme than the first abnormal score. We will now look at classical or Pavlovian conditioning. So in the original experiment of Pavlov, the food that was given to a dog was preceded by a bell sound. 
By doing this, the dog was conditioned to expect food whenever the bell sounded. In due course, the dog salivated just at the sound of the bell even without any food. So in this classical experiment, food was the unconditioned stimulus, salivation that was induced by the food was the unconditioned response, bell was the conditioned stimulus and salivation induced by bell was the conditioned response. So step one was before conditioning, so where you present the food which is the unconditioned stimulus and the dog salivated which is the unconditioned response. And before conditioning, bell was a neutral stimulus. So when you presented the bell, it elicited no response, no salivation in the dog. Then during conditioning, you present the bell before the food every time and the dog salivated which is still the unconditioned response because here the salivation is in response to the food. After conditioning you just present the bell sound and the dog salivated. So the bell becomes the conditioned stimulus and the salivation due to the bell is the conditioned response. So in a similar manner, patients who have past experience of getting better with medication may be conditioned to anticipate improvement by any subsequent prescription including placebo. So using the classical conditioning analogy, the past active medication is the unconditioned stimulus. The improvement due to the past active medication is the unconditioned response. Placebo is the conditioned stimulus and improvement due to future medication including placebo becomes the unconditioned response. So I have summarized uh, the points in this slide. So if you want you can uh, pause and uh, go through this slide. Patient expectations pay, play a key role in the placebo effect. So treatments that patients expect to be more powerful tend to elicit a stronger placebo effect than those that are perceived to be less powerful. So an injection placebo tends to elicit a stronger effect than an oral placebo. Among oral placebos, a capsule is more powerful than a tablet. The color also seems to play a role. Blue placebos are more powerful sedatives, while red are more powerful stimulants or analgesics. Larger placebos tend to be more powerful than smaller ones. Two placebos elicit stronger response than one and more doses per day, say twice daily placebo elicits a stronger placebo response than a once daily placebo. And branding with trade name elicits a greater response than an unbranded generic tablet. A doctor of uh, higher status elicits a stronger placebo effect than a more junior doctor. An optimistic physician can elicit a stronger placebo response than a neutral or pessimistic physician. And when patients are given clear diagnosis, information about the treatment and so on, that tends to have a stronger placebo effect than when the patients are not well informed. The more the visits the patient makes, the greater the placebo response.
placebo effect does not only occur in response to giving a placebo it is also the part of response to active drugs including antidepressants so as part of informed consent in clinical trials the patient will be given information about their likelihood of receiving an active drug or placebo and this can shape their expectations of recovery so response to antidepressants is higher in antidepressant versus antidepressant trials than in antidepressant versus placebo trials as in the former set of trials because there is no inert placebo the patient knows that there is a 100% chance of getting an active drug and so expectation of getting better is more and response to antidepressants is higher in drug 1 versus drug 2 versus drug versus placebo trials where two out of three drugs are active and so the probability of getting an active drug is 2 by 3 or 66.6% then when one drug is compared against placebo where the probability of being given an active drug is 1 by 2 or 50% similarly the response to placebo is also higher when the probability of getting the active drug is more benedetti et al did a novel study that examined the impact of uh, patient awareness that they are having a certain treatment administered or withdrawn so they studied three treatments in three groups of patients so i've listed them on this slide and in each group some patients were informed of the fact that they were receiving the treatment for example by a doctor who administered the injection but in others the patients were not informed and so they were not aware and they received the medication or the treatment as an infusion from an automatic pre-programmed machine in all the groups the efficacy of the respective interventions was greater when the patient was aware of the procedure than when they were not similarly being aware that a treatment was being withdrawn worsened the symptoms much more than when the treatment was withdrawn without the patient's knowledge so from a psychiatric point of view in this study neither the hidden administration nor hidden withdrawal of diazepam had any significant positive or negative effect but the open administration of diazepam improved anxiety and open withdrawal worsened them in other words when the patients were informed that they were going to give going to be given an anxiolytic that improved their anxiety symptoms and then when when they were told that this medication was going to be withdrawn it worsened the anxiety symptoms other psychological factors may also be playing a role the more the contact with professionals during a study the greater the placebo effect compared to routine clinical care patients in research studies such as randomized control trials they have more thorough assessments and more tests including physical tests such as blood tests they are given more information about their condition and they have more frequent reviews thus placebo effect in research settings may be much higher than in routine clinical settings similarly the response to active medication may also be higher in controlled research settings than in uncontrolled clinical settings to enter a research study patients have to be above a certain threshold of symptoms so there may be a tendency either consciously or unconsciously on the part of the assessor 
to overestimate the severity of symptoms during recruitment so that the patient becomes eligible to enter the study. After the study starts, this bias may no longer be there, so the patient's severity scores are rated more objectively. This can contribute to exaggerating the effects of both placebo as well as active medication. Similarly, patients who are keen to enter a study may exaggerate the severity of their symptoms either consciously or unconsciously so that they can enter the study. After the study starts, they may report their symptoms more accurately or may even under-report them as they might feel that that is what the researchers expect, that is, that patients who are receiving treatment should be showing improvement. So these factors can overestimate the effects of both placebo and active medication in research settings compared to routine clinical care. Let us now briefly look at the neurobiology of the placebo effect. Endogenous opioids and dopamine appear to play an important role in mediating the placebo effect, particularly analgesia. Functional neuroimaging studies of placebo effect in pain have suggested that dopamine release from nucleus accumbens is related to expectation of analgesia, while activation of mu opioid receptors of the endogenous opioid system is related to actual analgesia. Placebo-induced induced analgesia is partially reversed by the opioid antagonist naloxone, adding support to the fact that endogenous opioids are important in placebo analgesia. And following administration of placebo, the following brain regions have been shown to be activated. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex and the limbic system. In a positron emission tomography study of depressed men, both placebo and fluoxetine responders showed increase in cortical glucose metabolism. In addition, those who responded to fluoxetine also showed decreased subcortical and limbic glucose metabolism. We will now look at the placebo effect in depression. Among psychiatric disorders, the placebo effect has been most extensively studied in depression. Pattern analysis have shown that the improvement as a result of placebo in depression tends to be abrupt, occurs early in treatment and is less likely to persist. In contrast, improvement in response to antidepressants tends to be gradual, occurs later and is more likely to persist. So the improvement due to placebo has an early onset, is abrupt and is short-lived, whereas the improvement due to antidepressant is more delayed, more gradual but more persistent also. Even among patients who seem to be responding to the active antidepressant, if the pattern of improvement is consistent with the placebo response, the improvement tends to be short-lived. And placebo effect is greater when, when the outcome measure is continuous 
for example when the outcome measure is a score on a depression rating scale then when the outcome measure is categorical so you classify the patients as either depressed or no longer depressed overall about 30% show response to placebo compared to between 50 and 60% who respond to antidepressants there has been a gradual increase in placebo response by about 7% per decade over the years but the response to antidepressants has not similarly increased therefore the difference between antidepressant and placebo has narrowed over the years children and adolescents show greater response to both placebo and antidepressants compared to adults as depression severity increases for example psychotic depression placebo response decreases and as i had mentioned earlier response rates to antidepressants in trials with no placebo arm is greater than to antidepressants in placebo controlled trials because when all the treatments are active the patient expectation of getting better is higher we'll briefly look at the placebo effect in two medical disorders first one is osteoarthritis a meta analysis of placebo control studies in osteoarthritis showed that placebo were effective in reducing pain improving functioning reducing stiffness and the placebo response was greater when the placebo was given by injection than orally and a study looked into the placebo effect in hypertension this was a randomized controlled trial which compared placebo with six active drugs for the maintenance treatment of hypertension at one year 30% of those who were on placebo achieved normal BP, blood pressure when compared to 58% of those who were on one of the six active drugs on further analysis older white patients had the highest placebo response rate of 38% and they also had the highest response rate to active drugs 69% young african americans had the lowest placebo response rate of just 20% and also the lowest response rate to active drugs of 49% 13% of patients on placebo in this study discontinued due to side effects and the commonest side effects reported by those on placebo were joint pain headache and fatigue we now move on to the nocebo effect when a placebo produces prominent side effects it is called a nocebo the term nocebo effect refers to the negative consequences that result from the administration of a placebo in placebo controlled studies of psychotropic drugs the placebos tend to cause a similar range of side effects as the active drugs but usually with a much lower incidence rate non specific side effects such as headache and nausea tend to be more common than more objective ones such as qt prolongation like the placebo effect the nocebo effect also clearly illustrates the role of 
patient expectations. Usually, patients who are included in trials of medication have already received previous treatment with active medication in the past. As most major medical and psychiatric disorders tend to follow a chronic course. Hence, even if these patients are given placebo this time, they may anticipate side effects similar to those that they experienced when they were receiving treatment with the active drug in the past. Also, patients may be influenced by side effects experienced by their friends, their relatives, who had received such treatment in the past and also by the list of potential side effects described by the researchers before obtaining informed consent to taking part in the current trial. Even healthy people who are not taking any medication have been shown to have a high prevalence of a range of symptoms which are similar to the side effects recorded in randomized controlled trials. The side effects reported by patients who are taking a placebo now may be a reflection of pre-existing symptoms or spontaneously occurring symptoms rather than being due to placebo. Similarly, the RCTs may be overestimating the non-specific side effects of active drugs. However, the nocebo effect is not purely psychological. Studies have shown that nocebo hyperalgesia, that is an increase in pain as a result of placebo, is mediated by the gastrointestinal hormone cholecystokinin and this hyperalgesia can be abolished by proglomide which is a cholecystokinin antagonist. A systematic review of double-blind randomized controlled trials comparing fluoxetine and placebo found similar rates of placebo response in both men and women but slightly more nocebo effects in women. We will now look at the use of placebos in clinical trials. It is generally accepted that a double-blind RCT is the best research method to study the efficacy of clinical interventions. So the question is, should a new treatment be compared with an establishment, established treatment or should the new treatment only have to demonstrate superiority over placebo in order to be accepted as another effective treatment. The use of placebos for conditions for which effective treatments are already available raises an important ethical question, especially if such conditions can result in potentially irreversible consequences. Because in a placebo-controlled trial, you will be denying the active treatment for a group of the patients. Death by suicide is associated with major psychiatric disorders such as depression and this rare but extremely important risk always needs to be borne in mind while conducting placebo-controlled trials to test the efficacy of new drugs. Another important question involves the masking or blinding in double-blind trials. In one study, a majority of patients in a double-blind trial of alprazolam, which is a benzodiazepine anti-anxiety medication, versus imipramine, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, versus placebo, they could correctly guess whether they were 
on an active drug or placebo. In addition, the masked or blind assessors were even able to distinguish between the two active drugs. Informed consent while taking part in an RCT entails the patient being made aware that they will be receiving either an active drug or placebo. Therefore, it may not require more than just monitoring one's side effects closely to accurately determine whether one is on an active medication or placebo. In addition to ethical issues, RCTs which have a placebo control group also have other limitations. When you are doing an RCT, you are comparing the different groups and you can only demonstrate statistically significant differences. However, if the sample size that you are studying is very large, even if the difference in clinical outcome between the two or more groups that are being compared is small and clinically insignificant, it may be detected as being significant by the statistical test and that is how it would be reported when it is published in a journal. In any randomized controlled trial, the placebo is made by the manufacturer of the active drug so that it looks identical to the active drug. Hence, placebos which are used in one study will be different in size, color, in form, whether tablet or capsule, from those used in another study, depending on the form of the active drug which is being used in the different studies. So this may account for the wide variation in placebo response that is observed for the same condition in different trials. In conclusion, despite 60 years having passed since the recognition of placebo effect in modern medicine, this phenomenon has not yet been fully understood. The issues that have been discussed here are relevant not just for drugs used in psychiatry, but also for drugs used in other branches of medicine. Factors that increase placebo effect, such as the optimistic attitude of the clinician, performing thorough assessments before making a diagnosis, informing the patient about their condition, about the treatment that they are being given, regular reviews to monitor progress and so on. These factors should be incorporated into routine practice as far as possible by all doctors so that the clinical response to any treatment is enhanced. Before we finish, we'll go through a set of five MCQs. This is the first MCQ. Choose the correct option. Response to placebo in a placebo-controlled RCT is option one, directly proportional to the likelihood of receiving an active drug, two, inversely proportional to the likelihood of receiving an active drug, or three, independent of the likelihood of receiving an active drug. If you want, you can pause and select your answer. The correct answer is one, response to placebo in a placebo controlled trial is directly proportional to the likelihood of receiving an active drug. So if a placebo is being compared against one drug, the likelihood of receiving the active drug is 1 by 2 or 50 percent. If a placebo is compared against two active drugs, the likelihood of receiving an active drug is 2 by 3 or 66 percent. So the placebo response will be greater in the latter trial than in the former trial. 
Question 2. Which of the following is correct? The rate of response to placebo in trials of antidepressants has been gradually increasing over the years. Option 2. The rate has been gradually decreasing over the years. And option 3. The rate of response has steadily remained the same over the years. If you want, you can pause now and choose your answer. The correct option is 1. The rate of response to placebo in trials of antidepressants has gradually been increasing over the years. Question 3. Studies of the placebo effect in depression trials have shown that Option 1. Antidepressants have little evidence for clinical benefit and should not be used. Option 2. Placebos are at least as good as antidepressants. And option 3. Response to placebo and antidepressants tend to follow different patterns. You can pause now and select your option. The correct answer is option 3. We have seen that there is a difference in response rate between antidepressants and placebos. So, statistically also antidepressants are better than placebo. And when you look at pattern analysis, looking at response to placebo and antidepressants, we find that response to placebo tends to be early, abrupt and short-lived, while response to antidepressants tends to be delayed, more gradual and more sustained. Question 4. Which of the following is not associated with a stronger placebo effect? There are four options given. If you want, you can pause now and select your choice. The correct option is option 3. This option is not true. The other options are all associated, are all true. A capsule gives a stronger placebo effect than a tablet. Two tablets are more powerful than one. A senior doctor elicits a stronger placebo response than a junior doctor. And a branded tablet is associated with a higher response than an unbranded generic tablet. The final question. In order to generate the conditioned response, Pavlov in his classical experiment Option 1 presented the bell and food at the same time, 2 presented the bell before the food, 3 presented the food before the bell, and 4 randomly presented the food and the bell. You can pause now and select your choice. The correct answer is 2. He presented the bell sound before the food because the bell should predict the arrival of food and only by that you can associate the bell with the food consistently so that when you are presenting the bell without food the dog shows salivation which is the conditioned response. We have now come to the end of this presentation. Hope you found this lecture useful. Thank you for watching.